Good morning. Um, I've got all dressed up because I'm going to do my tarot card stuff and do some dress rehearsals and see that's not going to work. It's already falling. But um, anyway, first off, I wanted, I want people that don't believe in tarot or um, that don't understand it to just listen to this really quick. Um, it's, I, I want um, the people, especially those people that are close to me that I know follow me that don't necessarily agree with everything I do. Um, but just take a quick listen to this. It's, it's kind of an important message and don't have to agree with it, um, but I don't want you to shy away just because it's about tarot. So I had a tarot reading not too long ago, literally a few days ago. And during that reading, and I will say the reading was by Mercury and Magpie and Megan, um, the, the reason why I'm bringing it to um, the attention is, well, she kind of told me to. So um, during that reading, there was a lot of um, things that she asked me to do. I'm writing down notes. Okay, I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that. And and with that said, that alone tells you that tarot is not just about divination and telling you what's going to happen in the future. It is so important, and this is such an important message for those of you who don't understand and don't know the tarot. The tarot is also really about giving us direction and helping us just make up our mind or giving us tools to move forward when, when we're stuck on something. So um, it, it's not magic always, and it can be. Um, and I think, it, I will say this, it is all what you want it to be. If you want it to be magic, it definitely can be magic. If you just want it for guidance, it definitely can be guidance. So anyway, I got that out of the way. That's what about tarot is about. And that's why I'm doing these fun stories because I want to talk about the meanings of the tarot and how fun they really are and how cool they are. Um, but not just that. So I had this reading. This is the important part. <laughs> I had this reading and um, she had noticed and she knows personally, but she also noticed during the reading that I struggled and I've had a lot of struggles. So I'm going to go through that really quickly. Um, when I was married, I had a man that, that it was a, it was a tough, horrible marriage. I stayed in it way too long. Um, needless to say, I got out of it. Um, and I'm not going to lie that, you know, raising my kids was no easy task. Um, I, um, I, I did never have a voice, never had a voice growing up. Um, and I didn't have that voice, not because I didn't have parents that listened. I didn't have that voice because my ideas and my thoughts and what I enjoyed and, the, and my personality was not the norm and it was not, um, you know, that was during the 60s and 70s where um, my parents were still, you know, pretty conservative and, and I was conservative. Like I say, I wasn't like totally out there, but I was different and, um, and I did things differently. I didn't do things as they should be done. And um, so I struggled with that. And then I struggled with, I got into a marriage, I think, just to get away from things. But I didn't realize, too, how essential of a person I was. And, and, and what's a real bummer about that is I didn't even realize that until after I got divorced in my 50s. But um, I think I knew, but I didn't get a chance to explore it. But at the same time, um, that's a very important quality. And I think um, and it's not just about sex, please. It's not just about that at all. Um, people automatically think that because you're being sensual or being sexy or feeling that way or talking about it, that you're talking directly about sex. It's really not about that at all. Um, you know, I'm single. I'm not seeing anyone. And, and I still want to feel sexy. And I still want to embrace who I am on a sensual side. Anyway, I'm going way off topic. So, um, but this comes to play with what Megan was talking about and what she had asked me to do, though, with all the things that I had been through to take a quick look at that and um, understand that I came out of it. And that's so hard for me to do. And she even said, you don't give yourself enough credit. And I don't. And I won't. Um, I just won't. Um, I will share it. And I will talk about it, but I still, even when I do that, I don't see it as any big leap of faith or I just did what I had to do. But um, getting out of that marriage was one step. Um, then embracing who I was was a whole new step. And when I did that, 
I became two different personalities. I became Karen that I used for work and for family and that direction on the conservative side of my area. And then I became Veronica Carlisle, who um, has dreams. And, and I had an account called Veronica's Dreams. My website is Veronica's Dreams. And it's who I dream, dreamt to be. And putting those two together, I really realized that your dreams are who you should be, right? That you shouldn't have to hide that. Um, and I do, and I still do. I, I try to keep respect to my family so they don't get embarrassed about what's Karen doing now, but I don't care. <laughs> get embarrassed. You can say, oh yeah, that's my daughter. That's my sister. She's up to something again. But um, I do like to be taken a little bit seriously too, even though I like to have fun. So Megan asked me to look back, so I did. So first, becoming someone different, just to hide who I really am from people around me. That was the first thing, and that was a hard thing. Um, getting out of that bad marriage was a hard thing. Um, meeting a man that I, I loved like tremendously, or I don't know if I loved him or he just made me warm and fuzzy inside, and um, he kept my flame like up to here. And, and and not just physically, but I'm talking mentally and intellectually, and and there was a lot of growth there. And um, he's not good for me, so he comes and goes, and it's not good, but it's good. <laughs> if that makes any bit of sense. I think it's okay because I know it's not good. Um, if I was thirty something, I wouldn't have known it wasn't good. And I think that is a clue too. And that's why I always allow him back into my life when he chooses to be back into my life. I allow that. Um, people look at me and, and want to slap me for that. And what's he, what are you doing? You know, you deserve better. Or you can have better. And I always say, what is better? What is really better? At least I know that when we're together, even if it's only for a weekend or, you know, a couple months that we're talking and visiting and doing that kind of thing, at least I know that time is genuine and it's true and he's honest with me. He's not honest with me when he takes a step away, but I kind of know now that he's moving on for a little bit and I do deserve more. I do deserve better than that for all of you are <laughs> thinking that, but at the same time, if you only really knew how, what he brings out in me, you would understand. So, and again, that's not just physical, it's the overall. Um, that was, the, that was a big thing. So the, the, that and the hurdle. And then, you know, I was really excited. My daughter was going to take me out to dinner on my 54th birthday. And I did have some issues with a blood test and I needed to go into a doctor and I had asked, um, the doctor that took the blood, what should I do? Because I didn't have a primary care physician. And she said, you know what, just go to the university hospital emergency room and they'll take, um, they'll find you a physician. So that's all she said to me. And so my daughter and I are going, okay, well, it's my birthday, my 54th birthday. What am I going to do? Um, we're going to go out to dinner. And she goes, you know what, Mom? It's Friday night. Let's let's go out to dinner tomorrow night, and let's go get you into the hospital and, and get that thing rolling so we don't have to worry about it, and it's off our plate. Okay, so we stopped at Quiznos, got a sandwich, and went to the hospital. Um, I had stopped also at the other doctor and brought the blood work with me so that they, well, my thought was, though, they don't have to take blood. So, um, oh, God, I would have never guessed this. <laughs> so when we get there, they like, put us in this one room, and, and, and a nurse or someone that triage, they looked at the blood test that's giving me, yeah, it looks like leukemia. And I'm like, well, I, I, don't, I, just, ah, I didn't believe it. And I want to tell you straight up that when me and my daughter run away, to the hospital. It was really literally just to get it over with. I was healthy, energetic, all there. There was just, I was just not feeling me. And um, yeah, so we went. And then um, we go and um, I get diagnosed. It's, it's immediate, you know, and literally they don't let me leave. <laughs> I just, I tell you what, I just, I, we were shocked that I had gone into the hospital and they were admitting me that day, that night, on my birthday. Yes, on my birthday. 
And you know, in the hospital or the doctors, wherever you go, they always ask you what your birthday is, right? And 34. And they were asking me, and I'm thinking, and everyone goes, oh, happy birthday, happy birthday. <laughs> Happy freaking birthday. You got leukemia. You're being admitted to the hospital. Happy birthday. So, um, which I took pretty good in stride. My daughter, I think, had a harder time with it than I did because it was just like, I, I can't tell you what a what a whirlwind it was. You know, I had doctors looking at me, two doctors over me, and I'm laying down and they're asking me questions. I got these bright lights on me and all of these things. And, and it was like, bah! and um so they admitted me and basically the full diagnosis was ALL, Philadelphia positive chromosome. Um, they were treating it to put me into remission and with the intent of, um, yeah, getting a bone marrow transplant. So they put you into remission first. I don't know all the, why they have to put you in remission first and then freaking let you go home and then freaking do it again. Uh, but going into remission, actually, all in all, was not a horrible thing. The, the chemo that I was given for that, it was chemo with a, um, a um, it was prednisone, whatever. Anyway, so, it, and it just, like, it was killing. It literally was killing those white blood cells. What they did have to be careful was it's killing them too fast. And they were, mine were getting killed pretty quickly. Um, and then the, once they bring you down and um, get you down there, then, then they kind of let you get your way back up before they give you that killer chemo. And um, yeah, so it was pretty dramatic. And it was, um, I was in the hospital for 30 days. I had um, had totally had to resonate all control to the doctors and the people around me because I had suddenly no control of, of my life or anything. I had literally had, and I'm a control freak and I had to let go. And my saying was, it is what it is. It is what it is, what can I do? I can't do anything. I can't get out of it. I can't change it. I can't make it disappear. I, it's I got to take it, and I got to take it hard. It was hard. Um, then, um, then that I had I did have a hip infection that we had to treat, and um, I had this major jaw pain that we had to treat, and did all these things. Anyway, so um, I was in the hospital for thirty days. They brought me down, and they let me go home. <laughs> well, here's where it really got weird. I started getting really dizzy and my daughter would take me to the doctor I and mean, we went several times a week because they had to check your blood levels and stuff and make sure that you know you everything was cool and they would give you um, plasma or they would give you platelets whatever your body needed um, because you lose all of that when you're when you are put into remission and so here we go and we kept asking the doctor we asked the doctor not just nurses hey what medication is she on that's making her so dizzy because I was like so dizzy, I had to like hold things to get up. I, and that's not me, again, even after all of that, that's not me. So we really were curious about maybe what was causing this and um, no one said anything. So one day my mom had to take me, and this was probably a week later, which is really, this is a very scary thought. Um, and I wouldn't let my mom push me in a wheelchair. She's 82, 81 at the time, I don't remember, but she, she shouldn't be pushing her daughter in a wheelchair. It just wasn't right. So I didn't let it happen, right? Gotta have some control. So we were at the hospital and we were walking up and um, lo and behold, um, someone saw me walking and I was walking literally crooked. And someone, you know, down the hall was like asking my mom if they needed help with me. And I'm like, what? I, I didn't even feel it. I want you to know I had no clue that I was walking crookedly. I had no clue why anyone would ask if my mom needed help. None of that made sense to me um, because as far as I could tell, I was fine. I was walking fine. I, um, you know, only when I would get closer to the floor or the wall would I realize that I was tipping or whatever. Um, so then they had to admit me again, and I had a brain bleed. The platelet count went down so low when they were getting putting me into remission that I had a, an internal bleed, which is a spontaneous bleed, and you can do that. My platelet count did go down to eight, and anyone that's a doctor, yes, it really did. It's in my chart, and I can show you. <laughs> because some people say, oh, no, you would die if your platelet count was eight. No, um, my platelet count was eight, but they did bring me back up. But being that it was there, I had a spontaneous bleed that we didn't catch. It was slow enough and didn't, um, anyway. That scared everybody to the nth degree um, because that was probably the most closest, and I didn't know it, 
to death that I had come. Um, that could have definitely killed me in all different ways. If I would have fallen and hit my head wrong, dead. Um, I can't tell you that I didn't even realize how scary it was because of that my brain bleed. I was like, Pew! all in a different world. I even have a YouTube video where I can show you I was all in a different world. And then, um, so I, that was the worst. They, they had to put a little plug in my head and they put this little thing in that drained the blood. And with that, that was fine because I was so loopy. I don't even think I remember them putting the plug in. They took that sucker out. That was the worst pain I ever had. And I gave birth without any medicine. So it was horrible. Um, it wasn't as long as giving birth, but it was a hundred times worse. Um, your brain doesn't feel pain, but there's this little membrane between your skull and your brain that definitely does. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, <laughs> I'm just telling you. Um, so, I'm going to stand up my hair here. Um, yeah, so that was worse. Then, my insurance kicked up. It's like, nope, she's not covered. <laughs> Out of nowhere. It was the weirdest thing. So, I was up for a study and they were going to do some expanded stem cells. When you get a bone marrow transplant, it's stem cells that they give you that, that create the bone marrow. Anyway, so, um, yeah, that happened and that was miserable. But the doc that was in charge of this whole study with the expanded stem cells, straight up, man, he was all in the accounting office. You figure out her insurance because they couldn't even let me back. So basically I had no insurance there for a heartbeat. And um, thank God, I swear that lady in accounting, bless her soul, she did everything she could, got me back on Medicaid. Um, there was an issue, basically my last employer, they thought I was still on their insurance, which I wasn't. Um, I had an HSA card that was left over from that, but I didn't have their insurance anymore. So, um, but for some reason it came up as I did. So that's why they canceled me. And then I didn't have any. And it was a, it was a mess because it wasn't like I had a month before I needed to go in and see the doctor. It was like, my bone marrow transplant is scheduled. And actually it ended up between the, between the brain bleed and the insurance, it got put out by a week. And um, I'll tell you, that it was scary because they do put you behind, um, if the rooms are all in this segre segregated room and they put you behind there and um, they, um, basically you can't come out of that area. They, there's an airlock, two doors that you go in and out of, like you can't pass the one door until the other door shuts and um, you know, everyone going in has to wear masks. You can't go out. I couldn't go out anywhere else in the hospital. I could walk in that little area, but it's only about 12 rooms. So you didn't have a lot of place to go. They did have a treadmill, um, which I did use at the beginning, but once I had the chemo, that was not going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, so then they, they set you up and you get five days of chemo. Two of those days, you get two sets of chemo. The two sets of chemo, the second set of that, those two... They were the, the worst. Basically, they, they even gave you a special soap. And when you had that chemo, you had to take a shower right after they gave you the chemo that night and again the next morning. And then you had to do it again the next day because so they and, the, and special soap. So that tells you how tough that chemo was. It was. And basically, I didn't realize this when it was happening, but I was told later that that chemo that you get before your bone marrow transplant, at least that I got, would kill you if you didn't have a bone marrow transplant. So the chemo sucked. I mean, it was bad and it affected me for a very long time. Months, 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 a year, maybe more. Um, and then once they bring you, bring you down, I also had to have full body radiation um, twice. So they, they radiate your whole body um, for 15 minutes um, twice. I did that two times and then I had to have radiation um, injected into my spinal tap or my spinal fluid because the kind of leukemia I had can hit the brain. And um, I do think that that radiation did affect my brain for a while. I, I finally feel like I have my brain back. Um, but that was um, a big deal. So then, um, yeah, I got that. And then things were starting to look up. It took me, I started eating. I, I was 135 pounds, 10% body fat when I went in. When I came out and um, 
that my bone marrow transplant was in the end of June, and then by the end of September, I was 113 pounds. And I had no muscle, no fat. I had nothing. I was all bone. And um, I didn't start eating again until Thanksgiving. It was really weird. I did have like two plates of food. My whole family was like so thrilled that I was eating. Um, it took me a while to put that weight on. Um, once I did, I put on even more weight, but that's okay. I'm healthy. Um, and then... The one thing you worry about with leukemia or any time, especially when you're dealing with chemotherapy and, and your immune your immune system is whacked, which mine was because I had none. I had to let mine grow. I was I was getting a whole new immune system. It was a baby. Um, and, and then I even had to wait. I had to redo all my shots. So I had to get all my measles and my um, rubella or all those things what is it polio all of my immunizations all over again just as if I was a kid and um, so I got I'm starting to feel a little better in November and then December I really thought I could start getting back to normal and I almost did and it really like felt started feeling good and it was six months and I was gonna do it I was gonna be okay in six months got an infection and this infection I got back into the hospital for five days because they had to give me mega antibiotics via the IV, um, and I had just gotten my thing taken out because they put a little port in you so that they can take what you do. I just got it taken out and um, got that infection back in the hospital. That infection did not go away until April, four months, four and a half months I had that infection. And that, I think, was the tipping point of, I can't, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing this. It's constant everything so finally it's April I'm starting to feel better um, I was getting healthier I was eating again things were on an up and up overall I got a job um, I was working contracts so it was great I was able to work on paying my bills off that I had slacked on and because um, I was sick for so long and um, I got to go to the Bronco game in the fall and be part of that uh, cancer awareness and be on the football field and um, things were feeling good. They, you know, I really started feeling really good and um, I did some more um, boudoir pictures, which really I needed to do. I needed that lift and then um, I was getting ready to go travel for work and I was really excited because I love to travel and I miss my traveling. and. COVID. <laughs> Are you kidding me? COVID. So anyway, um, I just wanted to give a quick story of what I've been through. <laughs> but with that said, with COVID really hit me hard because I was, I'm finally feeling good, you know, and I finally get to go out and it hit me really hard and I struggle all the time. I'm not happy with my job. I'm not happy with being home. I'm not happy with much. And um, the one thing I do do every day is my my card of the day, and it gets me up every day. It makes me put my makeup on and do my hair, and so I get to get that little feel good moment for the day. Literally, that's my feel good moment for the day. <laughs> um, I struggle every day. Um, I struggle hard every day. I um, sometimes don't want to be here. Uh, I really don't. And um, Megan had done a post that had said something about, you know, um, when things look dark and, and you can, and all I could think of is the one thing that keeps me from, um, I think is um, knowing that a lot of people don't think my cards of the day are crazy and all of that, but I have had enough people that have said that they mean something to them every day, whether it's bring a smile to their face or, you know, uh, maybe this card meant something or just my words meant something or just the consistency of it or um, whatever it may be. But um, yeah, um, I got to keep doing it, you know, and I got to keep doing it and I got to have fun again. And I'm going to do another rendition of this video because it's like 25 minutes long. Oh my God. So, um, yeah, I got to keep doing this. And that's why I'm doing my stories for the tarot. Because I need to get back and have fun again.